I'm going to start by making a confession. I hope you won't think any less of me because of this, but I just can't hold it in any longer. Unlike you, I just haven't spent much time with Second Peter. Or to Peter. Or for that matter, one Peter. See, that's one reason that the lectionary is good for preaching, because every now and then those texts that you've managed to avoid come back to haunt you. And there's much to be avoided about this particular text. To tell you the truth, I haven't liked it very much, because I used to hear sermons that were based on Second Peter, and they were all about the end of the world, and about the particular way that Jesus was going to come again at the end of time. And if you didn't agree with that particular vision, why, then you were going to could be condemned to the fiery furnace. I found sermons like that to be more frightening, certainly not shedding any light on the way I ought to live my life. So it's better to avoid it altogether, right? But it's also the case with the lectionary that sometimes the, ch- the text will choose you and get under your skin and bother you, asking you to pay attention. And so when that happens, I tell uh, my students in class, I tell, well, perhaps it's time for you to take another look at that text, to meet up with it again And to do that, to establish a kind of relationship with that text, perhaps the best thing to do is to start reading it aloud. Since this was a text that was written to be read aloud, read it aloud. Discover it for yourself. And so, I practiced what I teach, and I started reading 2 Peter aloud. And you know, when I came to that part in the first chapter where the writer who calls himself Peter writes these words, therefore I intend to keep on reminding you of these things, meaning God's promises to God's people, God's promise of presence and newness and challenge. Keep reminding you of these things, though you know them already, and are established in the truth that has been taught you. And you know, as I was reading this aloud, I felt like I was channeling the voice, the voices of the great cloud of witnesses, also known as Sunday school teachers. Now, the good ones, in my experience, were very capable of reminding me of what I already knew so that I wouldn't forget things like Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, not just you and children like you. Don't forget. I'm reminding you of what you already know. Don't forget. Never forget. The better ones would offer clues about how to to put that knowledge that I had been reminded of into practice by the practice of virtues that seem to be in short supply, like self-control, endurance, mutual affection, love. But the best ones, the best ones would talk about something real, something that had happened to them that had translated that knowledge, shall we say, transfigured that knowledge into wisdom. They would tell a personal story, for example, that would draw back the veil of their own experience and reveal how the faith they had been teaching and that we had knowledge of had become anchored in their lives and transformed their lives. And when that happened, you might say there was a little transfiguration like the one that happened one Sunday morning in 1968. The first school shooting I ever heard about happened that weekend. 
It was during my senior year in high school in Virginia. You know, Virginia, that state that is trying its best to put some common sense gun control legislation, making it real, putting it into practice. It was a Friday afternoon in our rival high school on that weekend, and a young man entered a classroom brandishing a shotgun that he had been hiding in his locker and opened fire on a classmate and killed him over a dispute about a girlfriend. The principal of that rival high school was my Sunday school teacher, Mr. Jimmy Sublett. On Saturday, Mr. Sublett, this was the Saturday after the Friday, Mr. Sublett paid a visit to both those families, the family of the shooter and the family of the victim. And on Sunday morning, he showed up to teach our Sunday school class. When he showed up, you could see that his eyes were red from grief and lack of sleep and the anguish of carrying the burden of that tragedy of trying to express some kind of leadership in that. But he showed up at our Sunday school class because he thought it was important to tell us what it was like to visit those families over that weekend. And though I do not remember the exact words that he said to us, I do remember the message of his life in that moment. And if I could put words around what the message was that I received from his life in that moment, I would say this. Boys, when I went to see those families yesterday, I had no idea what I would say to them. To be honest, I was quite afraid to say anything at all. But I felt like I had to go, and so I prayed and asked God to help me. And so I went to each family, and I was with them for quite some time, and soon these words that Jesus said to his disciples came to me. I will not leave you comfortless, Jesus said. I will come to you. And you know, Mr. Sublet said, it was like Jesus came to us. I can't explain it. I just felt it. And before I left, each family asked me to pray for them and for the other family. I look back on that story when I have to put my mind around those words that Jesus would say to his disciples that frightened them. Words that he had been saying to them right before, or six days before he took them up to the mountain. Words like these, if you would follow me, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross and be my disciple. What in the world could he possibly have meant by that? Well, in my memory, I see Mr. Sublett sitting there in that small classroom in that church so long ago as he drew his breath in pain to tell that story of that weekend. It occurs to me that cross-bearing for us may be daring to live a moral life in an immoral time. The writer I hope I get this right, Quinta Jurassic in the Atlantic wrote these words recently. The moral life often asks us to do things that we feel are beyond us. About as heavy as carrying a cross. Transfiguration. When a Sunday school teacher becomes a teacher of wisdom, When somebody that you've been in relationship for a long, long time suddenly becomes a witness. When the principal of a rival high school becomes a pastor. 
When things like that happen, some light shines on the way of Jesus in a very dark place. And as I understand it, I think that's what the transfiguration stories as they're told in the first three Gospels are supposed to do in, in those Gospels. That they, they, They're designed to pull back the curtain to reveal an activity of God that has been there all the time, but somehow has been hidden. And the writer who, who calls himself Peter tells this transfiguration story to those who might have forgotten in a fog of confusion and fakery and falsehood, who might have forgotten that it was God who said yes to the way of Jesus as a way of shining a bright light on that way of Jesus in the darkness. Now, it wouldn't be too hard for us in our situation today to identify with the kind of people that Peter was trying to address with this letter. And since no names appear in particular on the envelope, and since there is no particular address listed there, might as well be talking to us. Peter finds it necessary to call out those who are spreading falsehood and lies about the way of Jesus. Calling out people who are spreading those kind of things to cause doubt and deep division, to gain power and influence. And he uses some very strong language to describe what they're doing. See if any of this sounds familiar. They slander what they do not understand. They are irrational, creatures of instinct who speak in bombastic nonsense. In the end, Peter says, their substance of their words is like a waterless spring, a mist driven by a storm. Now, to move his readers and listeners out of this place of outrage and this fog of confusion, Peter urges them to remember a moment of transfiguration when God put an exclamation point, as I see it, behind Jesus' teaching about living a life, living a life that asks us to do something that we seem... we think might be beyond our abilities. Peter reminds us, all of us, that the God who was speaking to Jesus that day was the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Moses and Miriam, the God of Elijah and Elisha. This was the God that was saying yes to Jesus, yes to one whose word was formed from the depths of Israel's soul from the recesses of the prophetic traditions of Israel. These traditions were not formed for, in waterless springs, from tabernacles in the wilderness and temples in the holy city, from outside the gates of courtyards and fortified cities. This was a tradition. These were traditions springing from the root of Jesse, not some mist driven by a storm. God was saying, listen. Listen to the one who will also speak from another mountaintop at the end of this gospel, saying to his disciples, remember, I will be with you until the end of the age. I'm going to tell you something that you already know. I'm going to remind you of knowledge that you already have. That there are those present in our community who are claiming to speak on behalf of Jesus. And as they speak, their words belie their greediness, their exploitation, their deception, and manipulation. They are words that are creating confusion in the body of Christ, and obscuring the way that Jesus would have us walk in our age. But there are others. 
to others who are speaking words that serve, as Peter says, as lamps shining in a very dark place. Words that we can trust to give clarity. Words that are forged in the same prophetic traditions that form Jesus Christ. And you know what? They come in some unexpected places in flashes of divine light called tweets. William Barber outdoes me in so many things, but one of the things, he's able to preach by tweeting. And in it, he reminds us of things that we already know. Read history, he says. Pride and arrogance always comes before a fall. Always have. Always will. Every generation has its Red Sea. Every generation has its Pharaoh. Every generation has its slavery, its oppression, its Jim Crow, its kids in cages, its sexual discriminations, its disregard for humanity. Every generation has to rise up and fight. It's time in this season, could he be talking about the upcoming season of Lent? that we rise up and fight back. Now, I don't know about you, but it's words like that that I can trust. It's words like that that lift me up out of a fog of confusion and despair and take me above the cloud of confusion up to a sacred mountaintop where I can see Moses and Elijah and Jesus and God is saying, listen, listen. And like those disciples in that story, I am touched and told not to be afraid, but to keep on paying attention. Pay attention until the darkness passes and the day dawns, and a morning star rises in our hearts.